Thanks for checking out this podcast of Lone Star Community Radio, Montgomery County's community radio station. If you enjoyed this recording, make sure to check out our past shows online at IRLoneStar.com or their respective video or podcast formats on YouTube, Google Play, or iTunes. If you have any questions regarding the show, either it being about sponsorships or questions for the host, contact the station manager at D-I-C-K at IRLoneStar.com or call the station at 936-647-3776. This show was recorded in downtown Conroe, Texas, at the Lone Star Community Radio Studio. And Lone Star Community Radio reserves all rights to this recording and images. All right, welcome to the Agricultural Toolbox today. Actually got a shower coming down out there right now. Maybe it'll settle a little bit of the dust. So uh, gotten a little bit dry the last two or three weeks, and we've had a few showers come in and help us out, uh, try to get the grass growing. I know a lot of folks are still trying to put up some hay. Along with this, uh, you know, the dry weather, things like that, we've had a lot of uh, problems with insects. And also our livestock it has a tendency of trying to uh, stretch the fences and find a place on the other side of the fence where there might be a little extra grass. And today we've got uh, Sergeant uh, Jerry Guyon with the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department with us and uh, invited him to visit with us about that department. They have got a very unique situation there where they've got a staff that helps us with stray animals, helping people find animals have gotten out. Uh, protecting those animals and then protecting our drivers also because these, you know, animals get on the roadway and people are not aware of it. Uh, those are some severe consequences. So I've asked Jerry to be with us today and visit a little bit about their department. They've had kind of transitioned to this responsibility the first of the year and uh, they've got a lot of good things going on. They've got an excellent staff and their resources are coming together. So I thought he'd a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, how the, the scope of their department, kind of where their responsibilities lie. And I think a lot of people just expect them to do everything. So I know they got some limitations both on staff and time of the day that they can get this thing done because it doesn't take long when you're gathering up an animal. You All of a sudden, it's dark on you. But uh, Mr. Jerry, would like, you know, just talk to us a little bit about what's going on in your department and your responsibilities and, you know, when we get into how they get a hold of you and things like that. Well, thanks, Mike, for having me on the show. I uh, The Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Rand Henderson, took over this uh, this unit back january 1st and and so it was comprised of uh originally comprised of two constables deputies from precinct five and two constables deputies from precinct four um and it's just a it's a better idea for it to be consolidated with the sheriff's department and with it being countywide so uh we took this over and and it's it's we've hit the ground with our feet running i mean with the estrays and and it's just especially with this this dry weather like you was just mentioning it's it's been it's been crazy yeah, people don't realize that, you know, those fences that, you know, they figure the old animals will stay in and, uh, you know, it's a real hazard when they're out there and they just don't realize that, uh, you know, they're going to get out and who's going to pick them up if they're at work, you know, things like that are going on. Yes, sir. Uh, and, you know, obviously we're, uh, if, if anybody has an astray, I mean, it's, it, it is the responsibility of the sheriff in the state of Texas to uh, be notified when an astray comes into your yard. Uh, you can do that by contacting our dispatch um, or you can contact our, our office and uh, we'll, get a unit out there as soon as we can to, just go ahead and dial the non-emergency yes, sheriff's department number we'll get a hold of you guys then yeah if, if it's on the roadway i mean that to me that would be considered a, an emergency you know situation where we need to you know in that situation we'll usually get a patrol unit out there first to try to get them off the roadway and then we'll be notified soon thereafter um but you know the non-emergency line is, is always the best number to get a hold of us at and then when you know if you're out there uh again that's one of these situations there horse or cow or whatever you know if it's out of roadway it's awfully hard to gather something like that up without support or cooperation from our landowners and you know if they're willing to help us out of getting an animal into a pens and and then help you load them if it's something you're going to transport to your holding facility uh how you guys been able to accomplish that because i know you've you know, <clears throat> i was listening one conversation the other day and someone had, was trying to get their donkey back that they'd gotten picked up <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's off. It gets to be a little different. It, it's you know, it's a uh, the first thing we're going to try to do is find the owner. I mean, the last thing we want to do is is take the animal because that obviously puts a burden on the county because we got to feed it and house it and and, and take care of it medically. So um, we definitely want to try to find the owner. And if we, if we're in a, uh, a a cattle type environment like 1097 East up there, I mean, there's a lot of ranchers up there. And if we can go door to door and get you get around locked gates, then we'll try to go up to the houses and, and see. But ultimately, I mean, if we can't find anybody, we'll we'll impound it and use any resources we have to help us load it. We've got we carry panels with us on the side of our trailers. 
Um, and if we can if we can get the animal corralled good enough, we'll set the panels up around it, back the trailer up, and 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 get them loaded in there. Well, it gets to be a challenge if you're a foot, not horse back there, because <laughs> yeah, a lot of cattle are not going to listen. <laughs> <laughs> and and horses can sometimes be the worst. Yeah. You know, they they you know that's like trying to chase a mustang on a on on foot. You know, so cows, they're uh they they can be they can be a little honorary. So right, right. <laughs> Uh, and again, as far as, uh, you know, the, you talking about your holding facility, you still have the one facility in the Southeast part of the county, Southwest part of the County. Yes, sir. It's over okay. there off of Dobbin Huff Smith, uh, just South of, uh, spur 149. Okay. And the situation there, if an animal is picked up, you know, how do they, you know, when they contact you or, uh, you know, again, you can't find the person, we don't have a branded animal tagged animal, so we're not finding them. Uh, are you guys posting that information anywhere where, you know, a person like the pan, like, like they call the pound and try to find their animal is there a place where they can call to find out what animals might be yes. in your facility so we're we're required to hold that animal for 18 days and uh during that 18 day period we posted on the sheriff's department website uh the the livestock unit is is assigned under captain ray under east command so you have to go to there's a tab that says east command division or east east sheriff's department command division uh, you click on that tab, and the livestock tab will be right there off the side of it. And you click on that, we post all the estrays, and then we have to post all the estrays that are sent to auction. So even if it's been a couple months and it's, since you've been out to your pasture and you notice your animal's missing, which we've had happen already, um, you can still look on there and see if, you know, if maybe your animal is one of the ones taken to sell. So... Wow, I wouldn't have thought they were that long to go looking for an animal. I've I've had some call within two to three months later. So uh, you know, just you got guys with large parcels, and and so they you know they get out there, they've got a hundred, two hundred head of cattle, and they realize oh, I've got a got a cow missing. I ain't seen in a little while. So right. <laughs> my goodness. Okay, uh, and again, the uh, the the, the uh, animals that you, that are brought in maybe go to sale. Where do those funds go to then? Your department or some uh, designation that they go to to help your budget? Well, they, the the sheriff's department um, it gets refunded for our feed, and then what's what's left over goes to the uh, goes to the auditor's office, and then it gets put to the jury fund. So pretty much the astray fund pays for the jurors that are serving on our in our county and district courts. Okay, good deal, good deal. And then you guys have got also got a fee structure there if you are if you are required to haul an animal. Or you know either to the your facility or return him. Yes, sir. You guys have got a fee structure for that, depending on the animal, yes, I guess. Yes, sir. We um, it's it, it it's a it's a it's a structured fee schedule, but typically cows and horses are one hundred and fifty dollars for a pickup fee, and then thirteen thirteen dollars a day for a horse, ten dollars a day for a cow, and then any everything else is seventy five dollars for uh, a hauling fee, and then uh, seven dollars a day. Gotcha, gotcha. So okay. well, good deal. Yeah, and again, that's you know that's what you know. Try to stress to folks is you know be aware of your fences and make sure that we can keep animals in. And if we've got neighbors, I had one the other day over, off of East Williams Road. They called me and an animal wandered up in their pasture, and they went in and closed the gate and called me asking, you know, who do we get a hold of? And of course, send them your way as far as trying to find you know a landowner or something like that. So you know, hopefully the um, the, the surrounding neighbors will you know, help you guys out as far as getting that animal off the road and putting in containment so that it's not an immediate threat for you guys to have to get it loaded and expend your resources to try to get that gone. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, neighborhood situations, We it, it, and this pertains to mainly horses, we usually have pretty good luck on, on you know, locating the owner. You know, our, our biggest problem is is, is 90% of our uh, animals get out during the daytime during the week when mm-hmm. nobody's home. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard when you're driving through a neighborhood and you see 14 horse pens, you know, and you're trying to figure out, okay, which one did this come from? So. Right. You know, in those situations, we typically have to impound, and we usually get a phone call, you know, a little later, you know, won't know if we Are very up many animals branded that you find then? No, sir. And no, no. Cat, cattle, yes. Okay. We, we have picked up probably a, a handful of horses that have been, but for the most part, no. No, no identification not to help you go through a brand registry book mm. or things like that. And, and, the, and the ones that we have gotten us branded, uh, they're not registered with the county clerk, so. Yeah. We've we're trying to that stress issue. that, too. And, and again, I guess it's still, I, I thought that they had changed the law. I knew for cattle, it was illegal to brand an animal without it being registered. And I thought they changed it, it to horses also yeah, not pertaining. It's, it's, from what I've read on the law, it's, it's, it's all livestock, livestock have to be, you know, branded. And that obviously your brand has to be registered with the county clerk. So, so it's against the law to brand an animal and not have it registered in that county. Yes. Sir. So we, we really stress that folks, you know, go ahead and register the brand 
with the county. And again, that that particular brand and location on the animals registry. So, you know, you always get conversations. They say, well, you know, my brand's already taken, but you know, it can be on a different location on the animal too, you know, right hip, left shoulder, whatever the case might be. Yes. You know, it's registered both places, but the county clerk does maintain that. Have you guys got electronic access? I know they're trying to we, get that. We do. We have um, uh, electronic access through the county clerk's office, and then we also uh, utilize uh, Texas Southwestern Cattle Ranch Association. Uh, uh, the, the police officer over there, um, the special ranger, Brent Mast. Uh, Brent Mast. Yeah. yeah, he helps us out a whole lot. They they maintain their own database. Now, theirs uh, is not quite electronic, right. uh, so we have to contact Brett and get him to go through his files and, yeah. and, and you know, but the problem is, you know, is with, with cattle, you know, you, they, they change hands, you know, at the auctions, on, you know, on a regular basis. So we get cattle here that have a brand on them already, but that brand may belong to another rancher in San Jacinto County or something like that that's not registered here. So yeah, Exactly. Exactly. I guess that's a challenge in itself. But, yeah, we encourage, particularly our horse owners, I mean, a lot of livestock, but, uh, cattle, we'll go ahead and brand and uh, either ear notches or brands, things like that. But uh, we really stress our animals because we've seen that over time that, you know, when a particular branding horses, our horse committee does a lot of that work. And that you know, when, you know, we've seen situations there where they've taken horses out of the pasture, they'll take the unbranded, left the branded ones in the pasture, just mm-hmm. all the ones that were not marked. So, uh, you know, it, it is a tool that does work. And if we encourage more people to do so, uh, you know, it's a good tool to help de- deter problems. But at the same time, it gives you an avenue to find that animal. It, it helps, like you said, it helps out on the theft issue, too. You know, it's, it's um, we, we don't, we, theft, theft of livestock is not a, not a, major issue in montgomery county mm-hmm. but uh just speaking to breast bread on on occasion and, and stuff is it's what's happening is they're stealing the horse trailers and the and and stuff from montgomery and harris county and going up north and stealing the, the livestock so right. yeah but utilizing our resources <laughs> exactly exactly we have the nice horse trailers down here so yeah <laughs> uh and again you know you guys are responsibilities we were just talking a minute ago about our management plan for uh, storm situations and uh, I know you guys will be actively involved with that. Well, if that should situation should occur, but yes, sir. you know, is there? Uh, you know, we tried extension tries to do a lot of educational programs. It's amazing how many people, uh, livestock owners, do not own trailers. You just mentioned about the theft of going on, but you know, it's amazing how you go up to you're talking about going to you know several different barns there, and you won't see trailers there. But in fact, we did a survey one time. One of our horse specialists that did a survey of horse owners, and we found that is sixty percent of the horse owners did not own a trailer. So that makes it tough when it comes time for a uh, situation where the evacuation because of a storm or fire or things like that might occur, uh, you know, try to move animals in a timely fashion to get them out of harm's way. And, and again, we want to stress to folks that not to be worrying about calling you guys in that situation there. We, they, you know, they should be calling private landowner or private owners and other folks to help them transport that, animals and not rely on the sheriff's department to be moving these animals. That that is that is I mean obviously we're there to help everybody out as much as we can. Mm-hmm. But I've got um I've got four guys from Montgomery County and so and you know we're 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 pretty large. So uh if you can, if you've got friends and stuff you can utilize to to help you out initially, you know, then that's always the best phone call. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah that that's that's the tough thing. It comes time, you know, in in, in the history there uh, you know, we had you know a number of animals during the uh, Tri County fires up here at the fairgrounds, and also during Hurricane Ike and Alicia. Both, uh, we had almost 200 head of horses at the fairgrounds, and they came from different locations. And in fact, we had some professional semis haul them in too, middle of the night from co- uh, coastal counties. <laughs> but uh, it gets to be interesting. But I want to stress to folks that you know not to rely on on the sheriff's department to evacuate animals, and we see that on a regular basis. Even the storm uh, spring of last year, the year before, when we had all the flooding. And folks up and down Lake Creek Bottom, uh, they get in a situation there. They don't think it's an issue, and all of a sudden the water's coming up, and, you know, they're calling the sheriff's department there and saying, hey, we need some help hauling these animals out. And, you know, they just get all night long hauling animals and you know, trying to stress to folks that not to rely on you guys for that. You guys have got enough things to be tending to, and not to worry about that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Definitely. But, yeah, the, you know, the uh, Montgomery County Sheriff's Department has got this unit there now, and they, they are out there helping. They've got four officers and they've got more and more equipment as they go. So the biggest thing is that uh, realize that resource is there. If you find an animal out there on the roadway, please give them a call. Help them. Uh, uh, and you can even do some searching yourself. If you know somebody, you see an animal, and you know, you know you've seen that animal in the pasture halfway to back, half a mile back down the road, you know, when that officer gets there to investigate, let them know, where, you know a little bit of history so that they're not starting cold trying to figure out where that animal's from because there's a lot of pastures in Montgomery County holding lots of animals, and uh, it gets to be a real challenge. Uh, 
you know, we do lots of events and I'll see different horses on a regular basis and uh, they get sold and they go to, you know, someone else is new, the new owner of that animal. And, you know, you figure it belongs to some, somebody and all of a sudden it's changed up. So, you know, this retrieving livestock and keeping it safe and keeping drivers safe is just to be a real challenge. But we thank you for, uh, for being with us today. And again, hopefully we can you know, let folks know that you're out there and helping us uh, get the job done. Yes, sir, Mr. Armour. I appreciate it for being here. All right. We thank you. We'll be back with the Agricultural Toolbox in a few more minutes and after these messages. Remember to download the Lone Star Community Radio app from your Google Play Apple Store. Bring Montgomery County's Community Radio with you anywhere with your smartphone or tablet. If you are in the Conroe area, tune in on FM 104.5, 106.1. If you are on your computer, bookmark IRLoneStar.com as your internet radio station. Lone Star Community Radio broadcasting 24-7 from the heart of downtown Conroe, Texas. Hispanic Chamber Connections with Dr. Carlos Sanchez, president of the Woodlands Conroe Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, featuring event announcements, member highlights, and more. Tuesdays at 1 p.m., broadcasting from the heart of Conroe, Texas, on IRLoneStar.com and Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1. Okay, welcome back to Agricultural Toolbox. Uh, Mr. Goyon, Sergeant Guyon would just left us, and again, representing the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, and they've got uh, an excellent opportunity. There are some resources there to help us retrieve animals and, uh, you know, keep things safe because animals will get out. Uh, I've got a friend of mine I just saw on Facebook, her horse escaped. He's a Houdini, and he was out and about, and I guess he did find his way back home, but uh, that is an ongoing problem. Anytime you've got livestock, and uh, they're just, they're just going to get out. That's just the way it works. You can have the best fences, and it doesn't take but a tree limb to fall and push some wire down, and all of a sudden, they'll find that gap. Wanted to take a moment and uh, mention some programs coming up here shortly that uh, might be of interest to everybody, and then we'll get on to the, we'll lead up for that last program I want to talk about as far as water well testing that we got coming up there, but uh, some ideas of some programming coming up that, uh, so opportunities for you, uh, for our horse owners, our Montgomery County Adult Horse Committee, we've got a program scheduled for Tuesday evening, August the 15th, we'll get started at 6.30. It's going to be at the Montgomery County Extension Office. But, uh, again, there's lots of folks out there that are doing different things and making them aware of, you know, and we're always on the road, it seems like, hauling livestock and hauling our horses. So this program is going to be targeting as far as targeting transportation. And the speakers that night, we're going to have uh, uh, Mr. Dwayne Easley. He's with the Texas Animal Health Commission. I think there's a lot of questions out there and people may maybe not understanding the fact about Coggins papers, uh, negative EIA tests and, and its importance, health papers, vaccination documentation, things like that that need to be in your vehicle when you're taking these animals up and down the road, uh, particularly if they're gathering. If you're just even getting together for a little roping one evening or going to the fairgrounds for an activity, a clinic, uh, those papers have all got to be in hand because if they roll up and check, uh, in fact, I've even seen those guys roll up over here at Jones Forest in that parking lot there off 1488, and uh, they can roll in there and inspect animals. And if you don't have your paperwork on you, you can actually be quarantined. So uh, our program will focus on understanding those health papers, particularly the needs if you're going to be traveling out of state, maybe to get done with this hot weather, uh, do some trail riding. I know I hear a lot of people talking about trading, trail riding in Oklahoma, New Mexico, Colorado, places like that. And it's a fun deal, but you sure don't want to... Uh, get into another state and get into a quarantine situation because you didn't get prepared and had the documentation along with you. That evening also, we've got a representative from Gulf, Gulf Coast Trailers up here out of Willis will be there and talking about inspections and the things we need to be looking at in our trailers. Uh, time and time again, uh, tires are get overlooked and uh, everybody walk around that tire and it looks like it's great. No, no cracks in the sidewalls and all of a sudden they're blowing out on you. But there's some other things that we need to look at. So a representative there will be with us that day to talk about uh, that need as far as what to be looking at in those traders, make sure they're safe and uh, you're not going to have a problem going down the road. Also got a representative from the horse hauling industry uh, mentioned a minute ago as far as uh, some evacuation situations. There are commercial haulers out there, and we'll talk. I've got a representative there from this that's actual hauler. Talk about what they look at, how you get a hold of them, what their expectations are as far as the need, equipment they're going to pick up, how those animals need to be handled, 
uh, you know, leg wraps, things like that, just all the kind of things that you might not be aware of that help that horse get to the destination safely. And then also we'll have a representative from the uh, Sheriff's Department there. We just talked, visited about the uh, Livestock Division. We'll have them there also that evening just talking about making you aware and meeting those guys and, and visiting with them. So I think it'd be an excellent opportunity to uh, look at getting our horses down the road safely, uh, particularly gets this fall. Lots of folks go deer hunting and they're elk hunting and they're taking animals with them. And it's just a matter of uh, getting everything lined out so that you can get there safely, enjoy your trip, and then return home safely at the same time. Uh, Jerry just also met, you know, Sergeant Guillon mentioned the uh, Texas Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association. They've got a couple of meetings coming up in September. They got what they call ranch gatherings. We hosted one here in Montgomery County in Conroe a couple of years ago, and they go through time periods there where they offer these programs up. And they that program typically they'll have some health demonstrations, whether it be injections, talking about vaccinations, some hands-on uh, handling safety around the livestock. Plus, they'll have their inspectors to visit a little bit about uh, theft concerns, legislative actions going on that impact the beef cattle industry and our producers. And uh, those programs are very, very beneficial. Uh, they encourage you to be a member of the association. And again, there are some benefits, particularly if there's a theft situation, uh, they're quick to respond to their members and help out in retrieving livestock, equipment, tractors, uh, saddles, all those kind of things. Uh, I visited with, with Brant and some of those guys in the past uh, they spend an awful lot of time, and we've had tax stolen here, saddles stolen here. They were actually recovered in Georgia. So uh, they're relentless in their activity, and they tell us how to protect our equipment. But there's two of those coming up. One is going to be September 19, and that's going to be up at the Sam Houston Memorial Museum, President Houston Room. And, again, uh, contact that will be actually held Tuesday, September uh, 19, starting at 530 and go to about 8 p.m., and you can RSVP uh, through calling 800-242-7820, extension 192. Or you can RSVP through uh, RSVP at tscra.org. And Stacy Fox is the lady that puts these programs together. She does an excellent job. And again, a very good program will be had. And again, a couple days later, they're having another ranch gathering. It's going to be held at the Hempstead Recreation Center. That's going to be in Hempstead. And the first one, I guess I didn't mention that the Sam Houston Memorial Museum, that is in Huntsville. And this other one is going to be in Hempstead. And again, same way, the 7820, same RSVP, just tell them which date you're looking at, whether it be Thursday, September 21, or it's going to be the 19th at 530. Both of the shows, our programs are 530 to 8, RSVP through both locations. And I think you can already uh, get on their website and find those those. Uh, ranch gatherings, or you can call our office and I can provide you with that information also. But excellent opportunities to meet other ranchers, hear what's going on in the industry and getting some updates. We've got another program coming up next week that's extremely beneficial. A lot of our producers go to it and uh, just a tremendous amount of information will be shared with you during that time period. It's going to be the 63rd annual Texas A&M Beef Cattle Short Course. This is actually held in College Station they're at Rudder Theater and the MSC Student Center. It'll be August 7 through 9. And again, you're looking at a tremendous amount of information, a lot of subject matter, uh, different speakers, uh, just a tremendous variety of things going on. And again, a lot of them are going to be hands-on, a lot of them will be lecture, but everything from uh, warm season pasture management, nutritional management of our livestock, landowner rights, uh, applied beef cattle genetics, beef cattle research is ongoing, uh, health topics, and then we've got some general sections, sessions talking about export markets, where we're going there, how we're helping our industry. Uh, then you've got some detailed uh, situations there, beef, uh, beef cattle production, and then again, 365 days on the ranch is going to be the title of that presentation. We'll actually be given some pesticide CEUs. I think about 11 or 12 hours of credit is given during that time period. But health management, genetics, uh, again, forage management, winter annuals, warm season perennials, all those things are, are, are discussed. Purchasing, managing stalker cattle. That's one of the things we've looked at in our area in the springtime. We've got a lot of extra grass. you got a cow-calf operation there. you got extra grass there. You know, it's hard to go buy cows, but we can buy some thin cows or light stalker-type cattle, put them on grass, utilize that vegetation, and then sell them when it gets hot and, uh, you know, put a few extra dollars in our pocket. But we'll discuss the stalker cattle situation. Uh, again, ranch, the, more of the range management, so that's the western part of the state. 
Then we get a lot of the reproductive management of these, these females, whether you're looking at heifers or cows, and then external parasites. Don, Dr. Swagger is giving leadership to several presentations. There's a lot of updates on the fever tick going on, and gnats, ticks, flies that are all going on. We've done some research on horn flies. A lot of that information will be shared with you. And then, again, the purebred cattle industry is still out there, and uh, there's some management programs going to be focusing on them. Then we get to Wednesday, and that particular one is his hands-on demonstrations out there at the farm, uh, fence building, more of the brush buster type of equipment, and then hands-on as far as the livestock handling. They're actually going to be over there at the uh, meats lab doing some processing and uh, tri- tractors, sizing implements, things like that. There's going to be demonstrations talking about that, how to purchase those, what's the size you need. Uh, it's real easy to buy a tractor that's too small if you're going to look at the cost and but realizing a tractor is an essential piece of equipment. If you've got a, any kind of a livestock operation going on, whether you're shredding, you know, post hole diggers, you know, the hand ones are good, but a PTO given one is even better. So there's lots of opportunities out there that you can utilize in a, a matter of utilizing uh, the resources that we've got, the information is there. So you're buying the right piece of, piece of equipment that will last and you'll get the years of service out of it that you wanted to uh, get into. And, uh, one of the programs I wanted to go ahead and mention, we our, beef, our, our annual meeting for our, our uh, Montgomery County Beef Improvement Association will be held later on in September. Uh, again, it's going to be Thursday, the, t- the Thursday the 21st, same as that. But we've got a marketing situation program set up for that time. I'll give you more information next time we get on the radio. But one other program I wanted to talk about right now before we go to break, and then we'll come back and talk about water well testing and the importance of it. But we are hosting a water well testing program on the uh, uh, 23rd of August. It's a Wednesday. We're going to be actually holding the program over at the Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District office on uh, Conroe Park North Drive. And, uh, again, it's uh, a joint program between Extension and ourselves. And uh, Drew Golson is one of our specialists from College Station. We're actually doing the program. And uh, we're going to actually have you bring in samples of water. We'll process them. But we're going to talk about the quality of the water that's in uh, um, the uh, wells that we utilize. There's a tremendous number of domestic wells in Montgomery County. Uh, A lot of folks are relying on water systems, but I don't think people realize the number of domestic wells still out there. And the importance of watching those wells and monitoring the quality and making sure that what you're consuming is going to be a quality product. So, again, that's going to be August the 23rd. The program is from 1 till 5 p.m. And, again, we've got bottles and bags, and it's a joint uh, type of uh, sampling process. There's a bottle and a bag that both need to be collected because we are going to be sampling for several things. The samples are actually brought to the day of the program, so the, the 23rd. So you can stop by our office. You can stop, stop by Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District office. Also, folks up in Walker County, uh, their extension office has got sample bottles, and then also San Jacinto County uh, has got bo- ba- bags and bottles over there in their office, and it's a joint multi-county type program. Uh, again, bring those samples. You'll collect those samples and bring them in with you on the 23rd. And there's a $10 fee. But we're looking at dissolved solids, E. coli. So there's a variety of things we'll be testing for. And again, the program is going to be very beneficial. So we'll go to break right now, listen to a sponsor or two, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about water quality and some of the things we need to do need to utilize to protect those uh, those uh, resources that we've got available to us. Listen in Mondays at noon to hear Conroe news from local nonprofits, businesses, upcoming events, Conroe Park events, news stories, and information that matters to you with your host, Margie Taylor of Taylorized PR. For more information about being a guest, visit IRLoneStar.com slash Conroe Culture. A Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's radio station with talk, music, weather, and traffic for Montgomery County. Have a question or comment about one of our shows? Want to know how to reach a host? Just contact the station at IRLoneStar.com or call in and leave a message at 936-647-3776. Get involved with your community with Lone Star Community Radio. All righty, welcome back to the Agricultural Toolbox. Uh, this is Mike Heimer with the Montgomery County Extension Office being with you today. And again, we've talked about a variety of things. And, and one thing we went to or mentioned before we went to break 
is the water well testing program we've got going on and uh, on August the 23rd. And I think it just, there's, you know, there's a lot of discussion about water and volume and things like that. But regardless of where you stand on that, I think the importance is that protecting the resources we've got is what's critical. And again, water is constantly changing. And, you know, we, there's a, uh, as water evaporates from our uh, lakes and streams and puddles out there on the driveway after a shower that we just received, you know, it goes upward relatively clean. And, and, and as it condenses and falls back down as rainfall, it's going to be picking up materials in the, so, in the sky, pollutants there. Uh, as it hits the soil, it's going to be picking up minerals because uh, water has got the ability to um, dissolve things and carry things. And uh, uh, that's what kind of impacts the quality of it, the taste of it, the color of it, and those kind of things that uh, we look at. And uh, understanding the aquifer, we're not going to talk a lot about the aquifer that we are involved with. But the big thing to remember is that not all aquifers are the same. Uh, they are developed differently over eco- ecological times. And, uh, you know, the size of the particle size, whether it be a porous rock, a fine clay, sand, silt, uh, types of um, aquifer makes a big difference as far as the recharge rate, the cleanliness, the, the smaller particle size then of the sand actually uh, you know, cleanses that water. So you've actually got a cleaner product, but at the same time, if you end up with some uh, high mineral contents in those, those aquifer uh, stratas, uh, then that also impacts the water quality because of those minerals that are going to be following in the water. But uh, the thing we need to look at is the Safe Drinking Water Act that requires the public water supplies. And that's what we always look at is that, you know, we talk about the cities and the municipal districts out there. They've got a standard that they've got to be constantly looking at and supplying a quality product. But homeowners in our domestic wells, we need to be aware of our water quality and utilize, you know, the tests that are out there that we can utilize to just double check on our water quality as we go through. And there are federal standards that are established out there that, when uh, you look at results that come back from the lab, uh, you can see, compare that against those standards. The Environmental Protection Agency sets the quality standards for drinking water. And again, there's a variety of those that are out there and they're available through their website. Uh, but the agency evaluates substances to determine whether they should be listed as a contaminant in the national primary drinking water standards. And uh, again, there's primary problems and there's secondary problems. But the EPA considers many factors when making these determinations, including research results. So things are constantly evolving. We're looking at different nutrients out there. Things are going on in our environment. And again, things are kind of always evolving. And again, then you get to looking at the cost of treating water, the potential health effects of a nutrient that might be showing up or a contaminant, the level of human exposure, the extent of the contaminant in the environment, and the technologies available for the detection and removal of that contaminant. So there's a lot of questions that go into water quality and what we're utilizing for our domestic use, whether it be our family, our pets, our livestock, all those are going to be you know, situated with that, that, those questions. But there are basically two categories for drinking water standards. There's primary and secondary. The primary drinking water standards apply to substances that pose risks to human health. For each of these substances, the agency has set a maximum contaminant, con- contaminant level to indicate dangers of being exposed to over a lifetime. And these maximum con- uh, contaminant level lists uh, don't include contaminant, contaminants that would harm other persons over a long, one time or a short time, one time, short time exposure. These are more of those that are going to be available over a period of time. But if your water well exceeds these maximum contaminant levels for the list of contaminant, it may be unhealthy for consumption, and you can either find uh, find another drinking water source, dig another well, or it might go to another deeper aquifer. But again, we need to evaluate the situation and see what's going on there. But there, for a primary list of contaminants, uh, there is an appendix B at the EPA website, and it's water.epa.gov forward slash drink uh, slash contaminants index. And again, you can find those particular uh, contaminants that they can consider primary and the actual maximum contaminant load levels that are published uh, as far as their standards. And if they exceed that, then you need to be aware of that. But that list is available. There's also what they call secondary standards, and these are set only for the aesthetic considerations such as the taste, color, and odor. And it seems like most people get about upset about the secondary things more long before they get concerned about some of the, the primary considerations that they should be looking at. But the EPA has set secondary standards for 
uh, these maximum con contaminant loads. And there are about 15 different contaminants that uh, you can look at. Uh, you know, your drinking water, that exceeds these uh, secondary uh, maximum contam uh, contaminant levels. Uh, they're most times not a health concern, but again, it impacts the taste, the color, and the smell of the water. And some of those nutrients that we're looking at, uh, aluminum, uh, chloride, the color of it, there's a different, there's a scale there as far as the, the parts per million on that, copper, the corrosiveness of the product, fluoride, there are some foaming agents they look at, iron, manganese, odor, uh, again, there's, there's some thresholds there for that uh, particular situation, pH, again, that's going to be, it greatly impacts the, uh, you know, appliances, the piping in your houses, low pH, uh, water will greatly impact those, silver, sulfate, total dissolved solids, and then zinc are all of those are listed as the primary uh, or featured uh, nutrients, the, the problems in the secondary standards uh, uh, listing of uh, copper and fluoride have primarily as well as second, have the, as well as being primary and secondary indicates that some of the water is likely to taste bad because of either copper or fly, fluoride, and it does become unhealthy to, to drink if this is the source of the problem. So we need to be looking at that. One of the biggest things that they get to looking at also is going to be our total dissolved solids, which is going to be one of the things we're going to test for when you bring those samples in on August 23rd. But the, low, the, the level of total dissolved solids, it will include the salts, metals, cations, and anions that are available. And this, again, is the collectively uh, listed as total dissolved solids. And it is reported in a single value, and it's going to be uh, milligrams per liter, which is equivalent to parts per million. And these dissolved components in water are usually bicarbonate, boron, calcium chloride, uh, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and sulfate. Uh, drinking water with more than 500 milligrams total dissolved solids is not necessarily unsafe to drink, but it may taste salty or stain your la laundry or plumbing fixtures. And your total dissolved solids is often referred to as a measure of salinity because of the most common mineral in high uh, total dissolved solids water in Texas is sodium chloride or table salt. And again, we see that in the nursery industry. It does show up quite often as far as damage to plants. Uh, you know, your salt content in the soil impacts the, the healthiness of those plants. So uh, it does show itself quite regularly when it does become a problem. Water in Texas has a high salt content because about 200 million years ago, the climate was very hot and arid, and the water in the Gulf of Mexico evaporated, leaving behind layers of salt early, uh, nearly a mile thick. And this uh, evaporate, uh, evaporative deposit uh, lies under the Gulf Coast Plains and uh, under the aquifer that we utilize, the Gulf Coast aquifers. And again, that's where that high total dissolved solids come, comes from if you're in that particular strata. If the basin and the range province uh, aquifers, uh, the, ancient uh, the uh, ancient dissolve drainage system that would not discharge uh, from the sea, like you know, you're talking about the Great Salt Lake, that's a situation there where it was a, uh, covered with salt water at one point in time. And then we saw a uh, change in the environment, recession, slate. The, uh, you know, you're looking at uh, continental movement, land movement there. So all of a sudden that's raised up, and that's why you have such a high concentration of salts there in the Great Salt Lake Basin. So, again, these things have all occur occurred over time, and we're talking about millions of years ago. A lot of this was over 200 millions ago, million years ago. But uh, the salinity is going to be a big problem, and that's what we need to be focused on. Uh, saline water can stunt the growth of crops and landscape plants. We've seen that over time. And if you are seeing those kind of problems uh, at your house and plants are not responding as you think they should for the soil type, fertility, amount of water that you're putting, uh, we may need to look at some other situations there and find out what's going on. But if your water is uh, a high saline, has a high saline content, uh, you know, again, we need to look at a combination of minerals that might be there and what kind of treatment method we might be able to put in place uh, to remove those nutrients or get them down to a safe level so they're not impacting your irrigation, irrigated crops, landscape plants. But mineral composition of water may affect its taste also. For example, water with total dissolved solids of 500 milligrams uh, composed primarily of table salt feels slippery, uh, tastes slightly salty, and, has, and is often called soft water. Water with the same total dissolved solids but roughly... Uh, uh, equal portions of salt gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, and calcite, calcium carbonate, will taste less salty and feel, feel, less separate, feel less slippery 
because it has a greater water hardness to it. So again, that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Hardness is a measure of the calcium, magnesium, and other minerals in the water. Hard water requires more soap for the laundry and washing and causes scale to build up in the dishwashers, washing machines, uh, your water heaters and plumbing fixtures. The groundwater from uh, karst limestone aquifers is typically hard because of the calcium and magnesium is uh, dissolved from uh, cons- uh, consolidated rock, which is going to be a larger rock formation. And again, one of those situations there where you've got a very porous aquifer, lots of movement, and you're able to dissolve those type of nutrients and, and get them in solution. And then we're pulling them up through our, our pumps. Uh, there is no primary or secondary standards for water hardness. The Na- National Research Council states that drinking water hard, uh, drinking hard water generally contributes a small amount towards the total dietary needs of calcium and magnesium. So in other words, you're not going to glean that many nutrients from those nutrients or water sources. And so it doesn't typically appreciate uh, appreciably affect your uh, diet as far as your new, those mineral needs in your diet. But again, the hardness of water is reported uh, using one of three types of measures, and that's going to be grains per gallon or it's milligrams per liter, as we talked about parts per million, and that's going to be that. But again, there is a pH scale. We talk about the hardness and pH and alkalinity do make a tremendous difference and uh, give you an idea as far as the pH scale. It's 1 to 14 or 0 to 14. If you can remember back to uh, you know, going to you know, your college, your chemistry classes, neutral is going to be pure water, and that's a pH of 7. And as you get more acid, you go all the way down to 1 and 0. Uh, being acid, that's going to be basically the same as battery acid, uh, you know, strongly hydrofluoric acid. And as you come back up, a pH of 2 is going to be more in line with lemon juice, gastric acid, vinegar. Uh, 4 is going to be uh, acid rain, tomato juice, and even beer. So some of those things there. When you get on the alkaline side, 8 is going to be seawater, so it's mildly brackish. 9 is going to be baking soda. 12 is going to be uh, soapy water. And then you get all the way to 13, looking at bleaches, oven cleaner, household lye. And a pH of 14 is going to be basically liquid drain cleaner. So you're talking about something that's very corrosive. And that's why we're aware of the pH of our nutrients. There's a lot of things that affect that as far as uh, the water that we're utilizing for our you know, chemical applications, things like that. It impacts the, the quality of the, the control that we get from a pesticide if we have mixing it with a water that's uh, off pH and having problems there. But the pH of water is a measure of how acid or alkaline the water is. And again, we talk about that zero to seven as being on the uh, acid side, and then seven to 14 be on the alkaline side. And if a limestone aquifer is slightly acidic, groundwater can slowly dissolve the rock to form caverns and open accesses to aquifers. And the water of pH can contribute to pipe corrosion and some taste problems. And again, you'll see this in some homes. Uh, all of a sudden, you got leaks in the pipes that you have not had before. Again, you can see a change in time depending on that aquifer, how deep we are. And if it's being drawn down, that does have a concentration of nutrients. So there's organic matter that, that's in there, and also there's some changes in your water heater that can cause some rotten egg odors. Typically, that's going to be not down in the aquifer itself right, when you get to the uh, rotten egg odor. If you're getting that rotten egg o- odor, uh, typically water heaters, that's from organic matter. We don't normally find that down there in a well, again, because of the environment. But there is some bacteria that will thrive in those uh, uh, low oxygen levels down in aquifers, but we need to be aware of those. And typically, that's not a problem that we're going to face. But again, if you're seeing some oddball things, those are the kind of questions we can ask. We can actually look at. And again, uh, there's lots of things we need to look at as far as quality, quality. You know, the pesticides. We've mentioned that time and time again. Where we store our pesticides around our property. Do not put those in the pump house. Now, again, that's you may have a limited amount of space, and you figure, well, I'll just put these things in there, but. Uh, you've got a direct corridor down that ch- that uh, um, uh, um, casing to the aquifer down below. So we sure never want to put any hazardous materials in the building where that casing is at, where that could actually spill, follow down there, and get into our uh, aquifer. Again, when we're filling also, you're filling uh, tanks to put water to mix sprays. Uh, make sure that you've got an anti-siphon valve or you never uh, submerge that hose in uh, the tank full of water. So if the pump should fail, they were not going to get back siphoning and whatever's in that that tank would be siphoned back into the well. So again, protecting our groundwater sources is going to be critical. There's lots of information about storing and handling pesticides. We talk about that a lot of our programs and we just want to make sure we do everything we can 
to protect our aquifers and, and take advantage of the information that's out there. So if you're unsure but just want to know, bring those samples, collect your samples, bring them to uh, our uh, the uh, uh, Groundwater Conservation District on August 23rd and take advantage of that educational program. Drew Colson does an excellent job, and I think you'll get a lot from that program. We thank you for being with us this week, and again, hopefully we provided we provide you with some information that will be of benefit. And if you've got some questions, feel free to holler, set, holler at us at the Montgomery County Extension Office, and also a lot of our program activities are also posted on our website uh, through uh, Montgomery uh, Uh Again, we thank you for listening for us, listening to us today, and we hope you have a great weekend. Thanks for checking out this podcast of Lone Star Community Radio, Montgomery County's community radio station. If you enjoyed this recording, make sure to check out our past shows online at IRLoneStar.com or their respective video or podcast formats on YouTube, Google Play, or iTunes. If you have any questions regarding the show, either it being about sponsorships or questions for the host, contact the station manager at D-I-C-K at IRLoneStar.com or call the station at 936 647 3776. This show was recorded in downtown Conroe, Texas at the Lone Star Community Radio Studio. And Lone Star Community Radio reserves all rights to this recording and images.